were complaining a few minutes ago that after the trial you'd um, gone into Harrods when you were a nobody, so why would we still hound you? you you're laughing now and, and plugging your shirt company. Um, I think I have time to laugh after what's happened to me in the last mm. two or three years, and you were partly responsible. Yeah. But let me ask but you. But if I can come in there on, on whether I was partly responsible or not, I was in fact doing a totally different story on Rent Boys when your name kept cropping up. I was dealing with, I was doing a story on Harvey Proctor. The chap who told me about Harvey Proctor said, oh, and by the way, I had an awful incident with Harvey Proctor. Sorry, the chap that told me about Russell Harty. And he said, do you want to know about this as well? And I said, of course. We didn't go seeking, the news of the world did not seek stories on you. The stories actually came to us through other things. I mean, we, we certainly weren't hounding you initially. I think it was the Sunday people. Well, we've, this story. is so well, awful. We've, prob you, we've you, probably you, see you come to say in detail. People that want yeah. to make a few bob, you know. And no, in fact, we didn't. I actually left messages on, on and your you answer don't machine, talk Harvey. To the person that it's I did. Uh, I left several oh. messages on, on Harvey's answer machine. I never, ever received a reply. Uh, well, well can I just but they still printed your story. Because I have two answer phones, <laughs> and I never received a message from you, although I did receive messages from tens, tens upon tens of reporters uh, over the months and weeks. And I believe, courteously, because none of the press attacked me for discourtesy, in every case where I received a message, I telephoned the reporter back, even if it was to say that I had nothing to say. Well, I but in, but in your case, back. on neither of my phones, because I've checked my records and I've kept voluminous evidence and records, on no occasion did you leave a message, you personally, mm. under your name. Well, I know that you, are, you go in undercover, perhaps you go undercover in different non-diplumes, etc. But in your name, I've checked my records and no message was left on either of my two answer phones. Harvey. So, you see, you say, I think your view is that before you print a story, mm. you would always check it out, wouldn't oh, yeah. you? Always Absolutely. check it out. Yeah. I, never an occasion. Mm. Right. Well, it just so happens tonight that I was looking uh, through some papers. Uh, I didn't know that you were going to be on this programme until about five o'clock. Actually, I think I do know the one you mean this one. And, um, and uh, here I have uh, in my hand, uh, there we are, uh, a story. And it's from the News of the World on the 12th of April, 1987. Just, in fact, before I was going to court. Before I was going, it was before the court. The matter was before the court. Uh, and I was in, under a legal injunction to say nothing, otherwise I would be uh, in trouble with the court. So I couldn't comment on this issue at this time, because it was between the charges being laid and my appearance in court, and I could say nothing. But you wrote a story which said, a former male lover of right-wing Tory, um, right Tory, that's me, is believed to have the killer disease AIDS. Now blonde bachelor Proctor's worried pals are trying to persuade him to take an AIDS test. And then you went on with other uh, comments, and you say, and one friend revealed, we're very worried for Harvey. The other man has lost a lot of weight, and though he's only 30, he looks really old and haggard. Now, I checked my records, mm. having seen this and hearing that you were on this programme. You never tried to get a quote from me on that occasion. I can defend that in the sense that I remember that story well. It came out on a Friday night. I wrote it very, very late on a Friday night, charged into the office with it early on a Saturday morning, and then went on another story. That, unfortunately, was left to somebody else to do. I certainly left you. The only number I had for you was your full well, and flat. Well, I can only defend well, me on well, that. Yes. How, but how, 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 yeah. how convenient yeah. for yeah. passing yeah. the bus. Yeah. yeah, having how said that, I. Uh, convenient yeah. for passing yeah. the bus. This was under an exclusive yeah. under your name. Mm. And that story and I later discovered to be wrong, which I will admit now. In fact, I met the person who was believed to be the person who had AIDS. Oh, right. And, and, and so you're, what, what so you're, you're telling the, your viewers yeah. now mm. uh, that, that, that the story was no basis in that story. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is that at that point, I'd picked up that story from an extremely good source, a very, very reliable yes. source I've been using for some time. Yes. And how long after this occasion did you realise that it was completely felonious and false? Probably about four months later. Right. And did you, in the same page and in the same headings and in the same length, put it right? No. 
Thank you. Nobody asked me to. Can I, can, I, well, can, can, I say, can I say that, that um, the press have got to realise that, like the members of the press, people who happen to sort of take on their time and energy in public life are actually flesh and blood, you know. And we do have families, and we do have friends. And the sort of rubbish that you wrote at that time was deeply hurtful to me, mm. uh, deeply offensive to me, and deeply hurtful to my mother, my brother, my family Same and my thing. friends. It was a disgraceful article to write when a man was down. You stuck your stiletto heel into somebody when he was down. He was going to the court, but you had to wring the last drop of blood out of that corpse that was going to that court. It was a very reliable source at the time, one that had never let me down before. And How you've I'd done nothing to put it right until, and tonight you I'll weren't going to come on this programme to put it right. You knew that. You'd had an opportunity to, to, to make your point clear and to put it right, right at the start of this programme, to apologise. I've just held well, my hands now and said... Oh, oh because, I like because I happen to uh, have uh, got to hand the cutting um, that, 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 that proved your mm. lie, but I'm grateful to you. Yeah. I'm grateful to you because, mm. at least under pressure, mm. you've put it right. Okay. That's more than many of your other a, colleagues in the press. As a follow-up to that, I could have actually done another story on you some months later. Yeah that involved a torture chamber, or that was how it was described to me. It was a fairly revolting um, piece of leather about the size of a double bed, complete with chains and manacles. The person wanting to sell us that, a friend of yours, friend in quotes. Yes, right. Um, you know, wanted to sell us that for, for quite an amazing amount of money. Yes. We actually had the torture chamber in our office. Uh, we took <laughs> pictures of it. In fact, I've now actually got it in my house. I now, what, is, what are you doing with it? Nothing. If that is in my coven, I'm very embarrassed when I move house next week. The removal men might find it. Right. Uh, we didn't run that story. We, I, you were just coming up in court. Um, we decided not to. We, we, in fact, took a decision that, in fact, was so distasteful and the rest of it. Had we been running that story, obviously we'd have had to have come to you about it. Yes, well, if you had have done, I would have denied it absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Mm. Did you complain to the press council about that story, Mr Proctor, as you're fully entitled to, and for that purpose the press council is there, and although I have nothing to do with the Sun and disagree with much of its policies, uh, the Mirror Group, which I worked for for a long time, had every member of the staff sign a declaration that they would abide by the <coughs> principles of conduct and rules and decisions of the press council. The press that was open you to complain, council, did you? Uh, nothing. Well, I, 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 I'm sorry, you see, but... But had I taken up in the years leading up to the trial and the surroundings of the trial, every inaccuracy of the press in every article that appeared at that time, I would have been forever writing to the press council and not doing what I was elected to do, and that is to represent my constituents no, to the best of my ability. Now, you see, what I, uh, getting back to Peter Hillmore's point, uh, at, uh, towards the beginning of the programme. No one in the press ever said that anything that I did in my private life in any way made me any the less an effective member of Parliament or in any way got in the way of the work that I did for my constituents. In fact, not before the trial, but after the resignation, I noticed a few crocodile tears in the press where, where they said just the reverse, and started at that time, once they realised I'd resigned, uh, quoting my constituents that um, I'd been rather effective as a constituency member of parliament. I'm not talking about the political side of it now, and of course we all have our different political opinions, and that's quite right and proper. Um, uh, some idea of um, acceptance of another person's point of view is, is part and parcel of the nature of our parliamentary democracy and that I fully support. But, but I don't think the, the press up to the time of the trial actually let some of my constituents uh, speak in terms of the work I'd done in the constituency. And, and none of the press could say, whatever was going on in my private life, which I regarded to be utterly personal, nothing to do with anybody else, nothing to do with anybody else, utterly personal, purely on a voluntary basis, no one got in uh, the way until the press started their stirring and aggressive activities. And what they did, I believe, was quite monstrous. And I would not wish any other person to go through that because I went through hell 
for well over a year. Aren't you saying you should still be...